Well, welcome and congratulations on making the top 12. That is a significant accomplishment. We'll introduce ourselves and then we'll ask you to introduce yourselves as John said, and I'll read the question and we'll begin. Uh, my name is David Hudson. I'm a First Amendment fellow with the Freedom Forum Institute, and I also teach law at Belmont University in Nashville, Tennessee. I'm Hank Chambers, a law professor here at the University of Richmond. So I've been at this for with We the People for a couple decades now, and I look forward to the conversation. And I'm Ben Glickman. I'm an attorney with the California Attorney General's Office, uh, also an alumnus of the program. I participated at Nationals way back in 1995. Uh, so congratulations again on, on making it here. It's great to see some of you again and meet anyone new. Um, my name is Conrad Drews. I plan on attending University of Nevada, Reno. And outside of We the People, I take part in our robotics club and our tennis team. Hello, judges. My name is Laura Flynn. I plan to study psychology in the fall at University of Nevada, Reno. And outside of We the People, I'm the captain of my soccer and softball team and an officer for the National Honor Society. Hi, my name is Nicholas Pietzka. It's nice to meet you. In the fall, I plan to study economics. And in addition to We the People, I'm in National Honor Society and the captain of the cross country and track and field team. And we are here with our teachers and coaches, Milton Himes, Sean McClellan, Ryan Spisman, Spisman and Ashley Nickel. Excellent. Well, we have chosen question one for you, which I will read. A result of the decision in Wisconsin versus Yoder is that, quote, any parent guardian can refuse to let their child go to school beyond the eighth grade or learn about a subject by saying it's against their religious beliefs. Do you agree or disagree with this result of the decision? Why or why not? What words, if any, are found in the US Constitution or in state constitutions that protect the right to an education? And finally, how have courts balanced religious beliefs with other rights? In Yoder, Chief Justice Berger wrote, the unchallenged testimony of acknowledged experts in education and religious history and almost 300 years of consistent practice support the claim that compulsory formal education after the eighth grade would gravely endanger, if not destroy the free exercise of respondents' religious beliefs. We agree with the decision in Wisconsin v. Yoder because it provides a religious exemption to compulsory education, which may have otherwise harmed the long-standing Amish faith. However, this case is an exception to the rule, and in future conflicts between faith and education, the right to learn must be adequately protected. Over time, the Yoder decision has had limited impact on education and other rights because free exercise protections were eroded in subsequent cases. For example, in Employment Division v. Smith, the court limited the scope of the compelling state interest standard for free exercise claims established in Sherbert v. Verner. In 1993, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act attempted to restore the strict scrutiny standard. In City of Bernie v. Flores, RIFRA was ruled partially unconstitutional. Collectively, these Supreme Court decisions and RIFRA muddled the Yoder precedent and undermined free exercise protections. Although there are no provisions in the Constitution that guarantee a right to learn, we believe there should be an explicit right to education so that it is uniformly treated as a fundamental right. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights states in Article 26 that, quote, everyone has a right to education. And additionally, 135 countries guarantee education as a fundamental right. Implicitly, the 10th Amendment allows states to govern over education and all 50 state constitutions do guarantee some form of basic education. In order to effectively protect education though, the national government should adopt the wording of Wyoming state constitution, which ensures a complete and uniform system of public instruction. To balance religious beliefs with other rights, the Supreme Court usually reviews the specific circumstances of a case and decides them on an individual basis as it did in Yoder. However, the court has also attempted to balance these rights by establishing various tests. For example, the court employed the Lemon Test, devised in Lemon v. Kurtzman, and the Endorsement Test, developed in Lynch v. Donnelly. 
These tests have led some to, des to describe the Supreme Court's interpretation of religious clauses as a, quote, hot mess, such as the appeals court for the 11th Circuit did in Kondratia v. City of Pensacola. The court has recently had to balance religion with health concerns regarding the COVID-19 pandemic. Roman Catholic Diocese v. Cuomo held that state regulations on capacity limits must be content neutral and not discriminate against religious services. Another contentious area concerns religion and expression in school. For example, the Supreme Court ruled in Engel v. Vitell that compulsory prayer in school violated the Establishment Clause, and they reaffirmed this idea in Abington v. Shemp by ruling against school-led biblical readings. Though unpopular at the time, these cases helped clarify that prayer in school went too far and fueled the debate over how separate church should be from state. A recent study by professors Lee Epstein and Eric Posner notes that prior to the Roberts Court, religious organizations usually receive a favorable outcome about 50% of the time. But now, religious groups win over 81% of their cases. With this research in mind, the court must work to continually balance religious beliefs with other rights or risk harming both. Fellow Nevadan Mark Twain summarized our government's inability to reasonably balance secular and religious interests when he stated, in matters concerning religion and politics, a man's reasoning powers are not above the monkeys. Thank you. We'll begin the follow-up section now. Let me start you off. You mentioned that later Supreme Court cases had, quote, eroded the free exercise protections established in Sherbert v. Verner. Do you think the Supreme Court should revisit its decision in Employment Division v. Smith? Uh, no, I think the problem with the Supreme Court constantly revising and changing its rules is like a very big problem. No one is quite clear on what the laws are, and they should stick by the idea of stare decisis and um, follow form former precedent that has been set. I would disagree with my colleague. I think the original ruling in Employment Division v. Smith was a very reasonable ruling. They decided that originally that general applicable laws that were not that were content neutral were allowed. And this makes sense to me that people or things such as using an illegal drug such as peyote can be regulated if it is applied to everyone and is not just targeting a religious group. I agree with the decision and the allowance for it shouldn't come from the courts or the judiciary. It should come from the legislature. Okay, so let's pick up there. So you, you, you close your presentation talking about the Roberts Court has been very solicitous of religion. It's been very protective of religion, including in Roman Catholic dioceses and more recent cases involving COVID restrictions. Has it gone too far? Has it, has it favored religion in these free exercise cases to a point that it's, it's running afoul of the Establishment Clause? I believe so. In Tandon v. Newsom, um, they compared the uh, restrictions on housing or in religious uh, gathers, gatherings at houses to the um, to a grocery store. I think that's not a good comparison you can make. And I agree with the dissent that it's like comparing watermelon to oranges. In addition, we can see in other cases such as Galloway v. Greece, the Supreme Court ruled that it was constitutional to open a town meeting with a prayer um, because it was open to random volunteers. However, the court observed that the prayer had been Christian related for nine years, but they still upheld this practice and stated that it did not establish or it didn't violate the establishment clause. But I think in my opinion that this isolated people from their government because it directly affected their relationship with their government in the town hall meeting. So what's the remedy, I guess, when the Supreme Court itself may be violating the establishment clause. You know, it's not like when our legislature does it where you could take it to the Supreme Court. What, what, do you, what do we do if the Supreme Court really has gone too far in this area? In Federal 78, Alexander Hamilton wrote that the Supreme Court relies on the, uh, the aid of the executive branch for, the, or for, the aid, or for its decisions to actually go in effect. And I think that the executive branch has really the only check on judicial power. An example of this would be when um, President Jack Jackson um, disagreed with the court's ruling in Worcester v. Georgia when he said that now the court has made its decision, let, let them enforce it. 
So assuming the U.S. Constitution included a right to education like Wyoming's, how would the U.S. guarantee that right to education? Well, one way the federal government would have to adopt the responsibility of paying for education on the federal level, and this could cause a ton of conflict. Um, but one way we could do this would be cutting 17.5% of the military budget or from the infrastructure budget to aid our religion, or sorry, to aid our um, education across the country. And they would also have to overturn the precedent set in San Antonio v. Rodriguez that education is not a fundamental right. And both of these things would contribute to a more equalized education, which would benefit our country greatly. By guaranteeing a unified um, education, you uh, up the scrutiny required in a lot of states, it's not guaranteed to be unified. In Nevada, for example, we're one of the few states that haven't been sued over uh, inequality in the school system based off of funding. And it would up the scrutiny of that and it would require all schools to be equally funded. It, would it also require equal outcomes for schools? I don't think so. I think it would require um, maybe a ratio of funds to students. This, it would guarantee an equal opportunity, but not an equal outcome. Let's okay. return to, uh, you referred to the uh, establishment clause as a hot mess. So if, if not lemon, if not endorsement, if not coercion, if not history and tradition, if not Justice Breyer's legal judgment test, what should be the test for determining whether something violates the establishment clause? I agree with the decision made in Employment Division v. Smith that all laws that are made in a content neutral manner with a compelling state interest shouldn't be granted exceptions to religion or religious organizations. And that's one of the reasons I disagree with the Yoder decision. And I do think the court has employed the lemon test and the endorsement test effectively in certain cases, such as in Epperson v. Arkansas. The Supreme Court evaluated the first prong of the lemon test in deciding that a state law um, that prohibited the teaching of evolution in schools was actually unconstitutional because the secular purpose of providing equal education and science was compelling enough to prohibit that law. So what so happens? Oh, go ahead, go ahead. I was just gonna say, so it sounds a bit like you're saying the test should be, we'll know it when we see it, but does that provide enough guidance to states and, and Congress? No, I think the Supreme Court should come up with a singular test and then stick by it. The problem with the court is that they keep on coming up with new tests for different cases and that no one's quite sure on what test is going to be used until the court, until the case is actually brought up to the courts. They need to make a new one and stick by that one. And this is even further confused by legislature like the Re Religious Freedom of Rest Restoration Act, which Harvard professor Lee Hamilton called um, or she said it was nearly as powerful as the 14th Amendment and that it ups religious scrutiny to super strict scrutiny in her words by adding a least restrictive means test. Should a student's desire to get educated trump their parents' decision to pull them out of school? Uh, yes, we can see in the partial dissent um, that, um, that they did bring this up, that the students should have a say in this, although in the Yoder case, it did not apply because the students agreed with their parents in not going to school. I disagree that students should be able to be removed at all. Using the precedent set in Pierce v. Massachusetts, that physical abuse isn't, or that the parental right doesn't extend to physical abuse. I think it should extend to also mental abuse in education. And Justice Douglas's partial dissent said that depriving a child of education can stump and deform their lives. How, does the, how do the courts protect the free exercise clause rights of students in the public schools? For example, can public school students join religious clubs? Yes, in Good News Club v. Milford, the Supreme Court ruled that there are allowed to be religious clubs in schools. However, they cannot be run by any staff members um, because that would violate the establishment clause but it would also violate the free exercise rights of the students if there was no religious opportunities in schools at all. Uh, 
so tell me more about RIFRA and RELUPA and, and how those impact the protection of free exercise. Uh, RIFRA really ups the, um, ups the scrutiny to beyond strict scrutiny, which is the reason Lee Hamilton objects to it so heavily. It um, ups it to not only the strict scrutiny test, but adds the least restrictive means. So we can see this in Hobby, Lo Hobby Lobby, uh, in the Hobby Lobby case, which ruled that the government in its, or the least restrictive way for the government to allow for uh, Hobby Lobby to not pay for contraception is for the government to pay for it, which I object to. It's absolutely insane that we're allowing these exceptions to universal and neutral laws that include a compelling governmental interest. And we can see all those ruled unconstitutional at the state level in the city of Guernsey, Flores, over 20 separate states, legislatures passed um, basically the same thing again and just brought, brought it forth at the state level. So does that suggest that the only protection for free exercise should be when the government intentionally discriminates against an individual's free exercise rights? I believe so. Not only that, though, the legislature should be able to allow exceptions, but it isn't the judiciary's job to allow exceptions from school or from wearing or from uniforms in the military, for example. I would argue that to effectively protect free exercise, the court really has to focus on the establishment clause because if they effectively eliminate religion from government um, activities, then they aren't preventing anyone else from having other people's religion infringe on their own beliefs. And so really upholding the establishment clause is the most effective way to protect free exercise. Okay, thank you. Awesome. Great job. Great job. Let's recognize the students for their participation and their hard work. We'll begin a, some some brief feedback here. Would one of my colleagues like to like to begin? Sure. I, I thought the, the opening was well structured. It got at the issues that you needed to needed to hit. Uh, I, the, the mention of RIFRA is always, always good because it gets us into a fuller discussion about where the lines are between free exercise and establishment. I think in the Q&A, we got to a number of different issues that were, were worthwhile to, to talk about. I think some of your examples were, were, pretty, were pretty strong. Uh, it was nice to hear about some additional cases that popped up as well. Uh, I, I, I do think that, that it would have been interesting to have even more discussion about lines between the establishment clause and free exercise. I think there's still a little bit more, more there, particularly when we start to think about folks who are not religious, right? That is, we, we're talking about it in the context of people who have deep religious thoughts and asking whether they're going to win or lose. But a bigger part of the, an even bigger part of the question is what to do with those folks who are not religious and what the Constitution says about how the government should think about their rights as well. So I thought it was a good conversation and one that I very much appreciated. Yeah, I would agree with all of that. It seems like you guys like bent time. We covered so much ground. It seems like we had we talked for a lot longer than uh, uh, the, the time allotted. Uh, my notes just overflowed my page. Um, I, I thought the prepared remarks uh, hit everything you needed to hit and then some, I appreciated hearing, you know, recognizing that the, the right to education is not enumerated, but then immediately saying it should be and, and citing to some international and, and state examples as, as to, to why uh, that's the case. And then, uh, you know, specifically advocating for adopting Wyoming's uh, version of that, which I thought was interesting. And then I appreciated the conclusion with the, the reference to the Epstein uh, Posner article and, and the, the real I think it's a significant trend in the Roberts Court uh, of, you know, protecting religion or, or deferring to religion uh, to a degree not not seen uh, at least in, in many many years on the Supreme Court. And then following up on that, I you know I asked that question, and you were immediately ready with Tannen v. Newsom, which is a state my or a case my office is handling. Um, and I very much agree with 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 your take that that they've. Uh, kind of gutted the notion of comparable, right? Uh, you know, they're purporting to compare activities, but then if you're calling, you know, meeting in somebody's house, the same as going to a grocery store or a restaurant, it, it doesn't seem comparable to me, but uh, that's why I'm not on the Supreme Court, I guess. Um, 
Yeah, I don't have much to add. You know, everything we threw at you, you had you had a, an answer. You knew what we were talking about, and you were able to support your your uh, answers with with supporting evidence. So, I thought you guys did a very nice job. I agree with my colleagues. I thought you did an excellent job. I too very much appreciated you introducing RIFRA and the enhanced statutory protections for religious liberty. Uh, sort of, the, you know, really the. Congress enacted RIFRA in direct response to the Supreme Court's decision in Employment Division v. Smith. And I appreciate all the hard work that you've put into this, and we all truly hope that you will continue your study and appreciation of the Constitution. Thank you very much for the conversation. Thank you so much for all your time. Yeah. Good luck. Congratulations again, Nevada. Thank you. Thank you.